Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video, we are going to be covering chapter 10 from our Campbell's 12th edition biology textbook. This chapter covers photosynthesis, so let's go ahead and get started. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Explain stuff. All right, welcome back. This is chapter 10. It covers photosynthesis. It's a very interesting chapter, so let's dive right in. Photosynthesis is the process that converts solar energy into chemical energy within chloroplasts. Photosynthesis is responsible for nourishing almost the entire living world, either directly or indirectly. These photosynthesizers are known as autotrophs because they are able to feed themselves. They sustain themselves without having to eat anything. They don't have to eat other organisms to live. They feed themselves by using sunlight and they get their carbon from the air in the form of CO2. Autotrophs are the producers of the biosphere. They produce organic molecules from CO2 and other inorganic molecules. So unlike you and me, autotrophs can feed themselves. They don't need to consume other organisms to live. They get their energy from the sunlight and they get their carbon from CO2. Whereas you and I, let me just skip ahead here, you and I are what's known as heterotrophs or other eaters, not self-feeders, but other feeders. We don't get our energy and our CO2 in those ways. We get our energy and our CO2 by consuming organic material. So we have to eat, right? We have to consume other organisms to get our energy and to get our carbon, right? So we are known as heterotrophs. There are photosynthesizers, which are autotrophs, and then there are animals like you and me, which are the heterotrophs. We consume other living things. We also can decompose things or eat dead organic materials. Okay, so again, you and I are heterotrophs. We depend on the autotrophs to live. In fact, Without these autotrophs, without these photosynthesizers, we wouldn't have any food, any nourishment to eat. They really are the bottom of the food chain, which is wonderful for us. And what are these photosynthesizers? They include plants, right? Eukaryotes, such as plants. Eukaryotes, such as multicellular algae, you know, the kelp and seaweed. And also unicellular eukaryotes, such as euglena or diatoms, okay? So many different eukaryotes are photosynthesizers. However, you should also realize that there are prokaryotic photosynthesizers as well. Cyanobacteria. These are prokaryotic bacteria. These are photosynthetic bacteria. And there's many different types of cyanobacteria. And then also there are the purple sulfur bacteria as well. So there are many different types of photosynthesizers. They all contribute to, you know, producing sugars and energy for the rest of us to eat. So let me show you where the chloroplasts are found in a leaf. Just to get started here, when you have a plant cell, plants have leaves and the leaves appear green thanks to the chloroplasts, if we were to cut uh, a section of a leaf and take a look at this cross section of a leaf right here, you'll notice that there are cells that are in the middle of the leaf, and then there are cells that line the outer, the upper surface of the leaf and the underside of the leaf as well. The cells that are in the middle, see here, the cells in the middle of a leaf are known as the mesophyll cells, meso meaning middle, and these are the cells that have chloroplasts inside, and each cell can have several chloroplasts inside. The chloroplasts are the location where photosynthesis occurs, and 
On the underside of a leaf are these neat structures called stomata, which you can think of as breathing uh, structures for the, for the leaf. They can open up to accept net CO2 and to expel net oxygen. So they respire kind of the opposite way to you and me. We take up oxygen and expel CO2. Plants have a net take up of CO2 with a net expelling of oxygen. Isn't that neat? So these are called stomata. You can breathe, you can think of them as little pores that can open and close to allow gas exchange on the bottom of the leaf. All right. And if we look at a mesophyll cell, one of these, one of these mesophyll cells up close, you can see it. It's packed with chloroplasts inside. It's those chloroplasts that make the leaf green. Because remember from a previous chapter, we talked about the chloroplast here and the structure of the chloroplast. And I told you that a chloroplast has an outer membrane, an inner membrane, and then it has these stacks of membranes, right? These stacks that I call, I affectionately call pancake stacks, right? Because they remind me of a stack of pancakes. Each pancake stack of membrane is called a grenum, a grenum. Okay, here's the term grenum. And each pancake in the stack is called thylakoid. Okay, so a stack of thylakoid is a grenum. And if you look closely, there's a membrane here that's called the thylakoid membrane. Now, the fluid immediately outside of these pancake stacks is called the stroma. Where is that term here? Stroma. The stroma is the fluid outside of the pancake stacks. Now, what about the fluid in the pancake stacks? Remember, that's called the thylakoid space. All right. So again, outer membrane, inner membrane, pancake stacks called granum. Each pancake is a thylakoid. The fluid outside is the stroma. The fluid inside is the thylakoid space. And what's this membrane called? The membrane of the pancake stacks. It's called the thylakoid membrane. These are important structures to recall for this chapter. So please remember your anatomy of a chloroplast because it's going to come up handy later in this chapter. Now here is the equation for photosynthesis. I want to actually head to the board and go into this equation a little bit with you because I have some interesting things to share about photosynthesis. So here I have written for you the equation for photosynthesis. Take a look. You have light energy, CO2, and water as reactants on the left side of the arrow. And then you have glucose and oxygen on the right side of the arrow. These are your products on the right. These are your reactants on the left. Now I'm going to ask you, take a close, hard look at this equation and answer me this. Does this equation look familiar to you? <laughs> That's right, Wicket. Wicket's on top of this. This looks like cellular respiration, doesn't it? We just got done in the previous chapter talking about cellular respiration, right? And the only difference between photosynthesis and cellular respiration is what? It looks like the arrow would be going the other way, right? So this if the arrow were going the other way, what we would have is cellular we'd have aerobic cellular respiration. The only difference too would be that instead of, you know, using glucose and oxygen to make light energy, obviously with cellular respiration we would be making ATP energy. Right. So, but, uh, but other than that, what you should realize is photosynthesis is the converse reaction to cellular respiration. Converse means opposite. Okay. Um, photosynthesis and cellular respiration are truly converse reactions. And that leads me to a really, really interesting point about photosynthesis I want to share with you. And I hope this blows your mind a little bit. I hope it's really interesting for you. Let me give you a thought experiment, okay? Um, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a thought experiment with you. What if I had like a jug, okay? And I had a jug. And let's say in this jug I put a person, okay? 
and here's a person in the jug, right? Now, what do you think would happen to said person in the jug if we plugged the jug, right? We had a cork here, you know, and we plugged that jug. What would occur here? Uh, well, you know, if we plug the jug off from the surrounding air, then eventually the person would convert what? Oxygen, right? Oxygen, convert it into what? CO2. And unfortunately, at some point, the person would undergo enough cellular respiration, right, to convert sugar and oxygen into CO2. But at some point, the person would not have enough oxygen, unfortunately, in the jug, correct? And the person would end up passing away. Why? Because people undergo cellular respiration. Animals have mitochondria, and that means that they undergo cellular respiration. So now let me give let me give you another example here. Let me give you another example. What if instead of a person in the plugged up jug, I did this? So now let me show you the second scenario here. Now the jug has a plant in it. The plant has some soil, the plant has some water, and the plant has access to sunlight, right? So, but it's plugged up, oh, it's plugged up. So now let's think about what would happen to our plant in this jug. Would our plant survive or would our plant die? So think about this, look at this. Let me ask you, um, if the plant is undergoing photosynthesis, right? Uh, then it is converting CO2, it's converting CO2, and it's using water and sunlight to produce what? To produce O2, right? To produce oxygen. Now you might think, well, at some point, the plant is gonna use up all of its CO2 and convert it to O2, and then the plant is gonna pass away, right, from lack of CO2, right? Just like the human, the human was going this way, the human ran out of oxygen and passed away. So why would the plant not run out of CO2 and pass away? Well, let me, let me make you think a little bit. Which organelle is responsible for photosynthesis, doing this reaction here? You got it, Wicket got it? Photosynthesis is done by the chloroplasts, right? Do plants have chloroplasts? Yes, plants have chloroplasts. Chloroplasts do photosynthesis. But let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. This should be a quiz from an earlier chapter, you remember the uh, cell chapter. Do plant cells also have mitochondria? That's right, Wicket, they do. Remember, I made a big point about that. S uh, plants also have mitochondria, mitochondria. So what did that tell you? That tells you that plants not only can plants do this reaction with their chloroplasts, but plants can also do the converse reaction with their mitochondria. So guess what? When the plant is converting CO2 to oxygen with its chloroplasts, it's also converting that oxygen right back into CO2 with its mitochondria. So let me ask you again, here, let's put our thinking caps on, right? Let me ask you again, would the plant survive in this jug that's corked or would the plant pass away? And the answer is the, the plant would live just fine. It would just recycle everything. It's the perfect green organism, a green meaning a plant. Uh, in that jug, the plant would produce oxygen, then use the oxygen to produce more CO2, and the plant could live indefinitely in this jug. Isn't that neat uh, to think about that? Uh, plants are truly amazing. Plants are self-sufficient. Plants 
do not need to consume other organisms to live, okay? Uh, in fact, plants are so vital, photosynthesizers in general are so vital to our existence. Let me give you three reasons why. Okay, the first reason why is they produce oxygen. They, they do net more oxygen when not in a jug. <laughs> they do net more oxygen for us to breathe than they, than they put out CO2. So the reason why we have lovely oxygen to breathe in our atmosphere is thanks to photosynthesizers. Photosynthesizers are putting that oxygen in the atmosphere for us to breathe. If photosynthesizers were to perish, we would soon after perish because we would not have oxygen to breathe. Reason number two why we depend on photosynthesizers. You see what a product of photosynthesis is? Glucose, chemical energy. Do you remember from chapter one we discussed how energy enters an ecosystem via light, then it's that light is captured by producers such as photosynthesizers or autotrophs. Those photosynthesizers produce chemical energy from that sunlight and then the rest of us animals, heterotrophs, we are the consumers who consume those en that energy, right? Those sugars and fats that are produced by the plants. Isn't that neat? So if photosynthesizers were to perish, we would soon after perish because we would have nothing to eat. And the third big reason why we definitely need photosynthesizers around is, look at this. Look what plants do for our environment, for our atmosphere. Plants take CO2 out of the air, literally, literally, you can think of plants as kind of sponges that remove CO2 from the air. They can take gaseous CO2 from the atmosphere, remove the CO2 and use it to produce sugars and other organic molecules. So we can thank plants and other photosynthesizers for helping regulate the amount of CO2 in our environment. CO2 is a you know, greenhouse gas. And by plants removing CO2, they help to mitigate that amount of CO2 in the environment and mitigate the problems with global climate change. And by the way, just for fun, look up stories of people who have grown plants inside of closed jars. There's even stories of people who have grown plants inside of a closed jar for upwards of decades, 50 years or more. All right, for these reasons, I truly believe that plants are fascinating and amazing organisms on the planet. They are so highly adapted to living on this planet. You know, if tomorrow all of us consumers, all of us heterotrophs like you and me and all the other animals, if we were to perish tomorrow, you know, the, your plant friend would continue to grow. The photosynthesizers would continue to grow on this planet Earth and have a great time and, and not think a, a thought about it, right? But if the producers, if these plants were to perish, if these photosynthesizers were to perish tomorrow, so would all the rest of us, right? So isn't that amazing that we 100% depend on these photosynthesizers? In fact, we breathe their waste product. We depend on a waste product of these plants to live. And we depend on the sugars that they make to live. And we depend on the fact that they take CO2 out of the environment to live. You know what's funny? If you think about going to another planet, you know, like Elon Musk thinks about, you know, going and inhabiting Mars one day, we would have to figure out a way to produce oxygen on Mars. You know, whereas if we were green people, if we were photosynthesizers, we could actually go up and produce our own oxygen up there. So if plants went up to another planet, they, they could make their own oxygen, their own CO2. However, if we went to, up to another planet, we would have to bring a friend. 
we would have to bring a green friend with us so that the green friend, a plant, a photosynthesizer, would produce the oxygen for us to breathe. Isn't that really neat to think about just how well adapted plants and other photosynthesizers are to living on this planet Earth and how, how uh, much we need them for our own survival? All right, welcome back from the board. I hope that was informative. Again, photosynthesis involves light energy plus six CO2 plus six H2O as reactants on the left side, and these produce the products glucose and oxygen. Now, you remember what happened during cellular respiration? During cellular respiration, glucose was oxidized to CO2. Remember, we took all the H's away from glucose. That means we oxidized glucose. And when we took all the H's away from glucose, what was left of glucose? Remember, it was the six CO2s. So during cellular respiration, glucose was oxidized to CO2. And do you remember what happened to our oxygen during cellular respiration. During cellular respiration, remember oxygen was our terminal electron acceptor. Oxygen picked up the electrons at the end of the electron transport chain, right? So oxygen was reduced to water. Do you remember that during cellular respiration? Now, this is the converse reaction. Remember, converse means opposite. So in cellular respiration, we oxidized glucose to CO2. Well, guess what? During photosynthesis, CO2 is gaining H's. It's gaining electrons. CO2 is getting reduced to glucose. And water is losing its H's, losing its electrons. So water is becoming oxidized to oxygen. Isn't that really neat? So it really is the converse reaction to cellular respiration. Now, do you remember our big overview sheet for cellular respiration, how it was a handy overview sheet to look at all the different steps or phases of cellular respiration? Well, here's a comparable image here. I really like this image. This is an overview, a big picture overview of photosynthesis. And what's cool about photosynthesis, especially if you're trying to learn photosynthesis, is that it's only two phases, right? You have only the light reactions uh, as the first part, and then you have the Calvin cycle as the second part. Uh, that's it. Uh, remember, cellular respiration had three and a half phases, right? You had glycolysis, oxidation of pyruvate, then you had the citric acid cycle followed by oxidative phosphorylation. Remember, there was a lot to learn during cellular respiration, but here there's only two phases. There's the light reactions of photosynthesis, which happen in those pancake stacks of the chloroplast. This is a chloroplast, by the way. This is a chloroplast. And remember the pancake stacks called granum? Well, the light reactions occur in the granum. And then the Calvin cycle is the second phase of this process, and that occurs in the stroma. Remember, the stroma is the fluid right outside of those grenum. And that's it. There's only two phases to learn about. So let's delve into these two phases. All right, so let's delve into photosynthesis. And photosynthesis is a lot more straightforward than you might think. I'm going to explain it as a big picture, and I think you're going to get it. It's going to click. Um, it's really not that bad. And I just want to show you the big picture so that you can see what we're trying to get at before we go into details, okay? So pay special attention and I think you'll get it. There's, it's not that bad, I promise. So take a look here. Remember, at the end of the photosynthesis process, you want to make sugar, which is some multiple of CH2O. You're gonna make glucose here. Well, that's what you produce at the end of the Calvin cycle, right? Now, what are the building blocks of sugar? Remember, you need carbon, you need hydrogen, and you need oxygen. So think of 
photosynthesis as a process that wants to make sugar. Now, look at this. During the Calvin cycle, what do we take out of the air, right? What do we take out of the air? We take CO2 out of the air. We literally remove CO2 from the air and capture it in the Calvin cycle. Now, what do you think we need from CO2? We need its C's and we need its O's. Does that make sense? Because to make sugar, we need C's, H's, and O's. And where do we get our C's and our O's? We get it from CO2 from the air. Now, what else do we need to make a sugar? Now we have a source of C's and we have a source of O's. What else do we need? <laughs> right, look at, we need some hydrogens. And where, where are we gonna get hydrogens from? What's another reactant of photosynthesis that has hydrogens? <laughs> That's right, Wicket. Water, look at this. Water is another reactant that's required by the light reactions, okay? What does water have? It has a couple of H's. Do you think we could harvest these H's and take these H's? We would like to harvest these H's. And where, where would we hand H's? Where do, what normally handles H's? If we were to remove H's like we did during cellular respiration, where do those H's go? Do they go directly to their destination or are they handed to a carrier? How about an electron carrier? Do you guys remember NAD plus and FAD were electron carriers or I, I preferred to call them hydrogen carriers because that's more accurate. Um, well here there is an electron carrier but it's a, it's a plant version. Uh, it's called NAD P plus and we hand, we're gonna oxidize water. We're going to take its H's away. We're going to use those H's and hand them to NADP+, reducing NADP+, to NADPH. You see, now the, now the H went from water, right? The H's go from water to the carrier, reducing the carrier to NADPH. NADPH goes to the Calvin cycle, and hands the H's to CO2, reducing CO2 to sugar. Isn't that interesting? So to make sugar, our C's and our O's came from CO2, while our H's came from water. Isn't that cool? Now let me ask you this. When you oxidize water, when you take its H's away, as the light reactions did, What's left of water when you've taken its H's away? You have oxidized water to oxygen. Isn't that neat? You have oxidized water to oxygen. Do you now see why plants produce oxygen for us to breathe? The entire reason why plants produce oxygen for us to breathe is because plants need a source of hydrogens in order to make sugar and they take the hydrogens of water. They oxidize water. And what's left over is the byproduct called oxygen. And that oxygen leaves those little stomata breathing holes and floats around in the atmosphere for us to breathe. Isn't that neat? Okay, so do you now see the big picture? Now, let me ask you this. Let's, let's go into a little more detail here. Um, let me ask you this. Do you think it's easy to oxidize water? Okay, think about this real quick. When you're taking H's away from water, when you're taking electrons away from water, who are you actually taking those H's away from? You're taking the H's away from this oxygen. What do we know about oxygen? Does, is oxygen fond of its electrons? Or is oxygen not care about electrons? Is oxygen electronegative? Or is oxygen not very electronegative? That's right, Wicket. The oxygen is quite electronegative because it appears at the top right of the periodic table. 
And so it is very electronegative. So this is really fascinating, isn't it? During photosynthesis, we are oxidizing water. We are taking H's away from water. And that's not easy because oxygen doesn't want to give up its H's. Oxygen doesn't want to give up its, its electrons. Oxygen is greedy, okay? In fact, oxygen is usually known as a, as a thief of electrons. It steals electrons from everyone. In fact, that's where the term oxidation came from. It's oxygen's ability to steal electrons from, from other substances. Isn't that interesting? So during photosynthesis, uh, the, 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 the granum in here, the, the light reactions are capable of stealing from a thief. It's like, it's like stealing from a thief, right? Uh, you're able to take electrons from someone who specializes in stealing electrons and you give those electrons to the electron carrier NADP plus reducing NADP plus to NADPH and then NADPH transfers those hydrogens and those electrons to the Calvin cycle to make sugar okay isn't that neat so so do you think it's easy do you think it's easy to oxidize water to oxygen if if oxygen doesn't want to give up its hydrogens no it's not easy and it's not spontaneous so we're going to need a source of energy to do that we need a source of energy to oxidize water to oxygen that's not a spontaneous process so we're using light that's why we need light we need sunlight energy uh, in order to properly oxidize water into oxygen and steal those hydrogens from water. We give those hydrogens to the electron carrier, NADP+, reducing it to NADPH, so that it can carry those electrons and those hydrogens to the Calvin cycle. And as an added bonus, which I'll explain later, I'm going to explain this to you, we also form some ATP. Um, so I, 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 I'm not going to go into this right now, but later in this chapter, I'll, I'll explain that during the light reactions, we also form some ATP. Okay, so what are the, so let me ask you this, let me ask you this. What do you think are the reactants for just the light reactions of photosynthesis? What do we need for the light reactions of photosynthesis? It looks like we need sunlight. We need water. Okay. Those are the two main reactants. And then what do we, what are the products? What are the, the main products of the light reactions of photosynthesis? It looks like the byproduct oxygen as well as some ATP, which I'll, again, I'll explain how we form this ATP later. And because we stole those H's, NADPH, right? So now the electron carrier has H's. So again, the reactants are light and water, and the products of the light reactions are ATP, NADPH, and the byproduct oxygen. Okay, now let's turn our attention to the Calvin cycle. Uh, remember, the light reactions occurred in the thylakoids of the granum, right, the pancake stacks, whereas the Calvin cycle occurs in the stroma, you know, the fluid outside of those stacks in the chloroplast. And now look, uh, remember, what did I say occurs in the Calvin cycle? We want to form sugar, right? C6H12O6. We need a source of C's and O's. Here is our source of C's and O's. It's CO2. It enters the Calvin cycle through the stomata and into the stroma of the chloroplast from the air, from just the atmosphere. Next, we need a source of H's. We're going to now we have C's and O's, we're going to hand the C's and the O's some H's, right? Do we have a source of H's? Yes, right here. Here's our source of H's, N-A-D-P-H. These H's which came from water, right? So we are going to hand the H's from water to CO2 to make sugar. Do you think that's a spontaneous process or do you think that requires energy to make sugar? That's right, Wicket. It takes energy to make sugar because breaking down sugar releases energy. So 
if you want to make sugar, it's going to cost energy. So do you know what we do? We use that ATP. That's where that ATP is good for, from the light reactions. We needed ATP. We're going to use ATP energy in order to hand the hydrogens from NADPH to CO2 to make our lovely sugar, right? And so what are we truly doing during the Calvin cycle, which occurs in the stroma? We are using ATP energy in order to reduce CO2 to sugar. Reduce means we are giving electrons to CO2 to form sugar. Um, those hydrogens contain electrons, right? So we are reducing CO2 to sugar. Awesome. So isn't that a cool overview? I hope that helped. If it's still confusing, maybe watch this section again. If not, let's continue on. We've got more details to cover, like what exactly is happening in the light reactions and what exactly it's happening during the Calvin cycle. We're going to go into more details now, but hopefully at this point you have a nice big overview of just how straightforward it really is. All right, now let's delve a little bit into how light works. And what is light? Uh, light is made up of different wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic energy travels in waves. And the wavelength is a measure of the distance between the crests of an electromagnetic wave. So here you can see there is an electromagnetic spectrum, which is the entire range of electromagnetic energy or radiation. Here is the electromagnetic spectrum. You have these energy waves. These are known as electromagnetic waves that travel through, you know, space. They travel through uh, the universe. And these waves are... You know, some of them are really short waves. Uh, they're 10 to the minus 5 nanometers, which is a very short wavelength. These are known as gamma rays. And the longest of the electromagnetic waves are the radio waves, which are several meters wide. Okay, uh, so you have big wavelength energy uh, radio waves and very short wavelength energy gamma rays. But in between, you have different types of energy. You have X-rays, UV rays, and then this sliver right here in the middle is visible light. These are the wavelengths of electromagnetic energy that your eyeball can perceive, right? So when you are looking at the world and you are seeing the world, you are capturing the wavelengths of energy between 380 nanometers, which, is, which corresponds to violet or indigo light, and all the way through to 740 nanometer energy, which corresponds to red light. Okay, And so your eyeballs are able to perceive every wavelength between about 380 nanometers all the way through 740 nanometers. And that's why it's called visible light, because it's visible to you and me. Okay, and each wavelength corresponds to a different color. So, for example, 550 is green, 500 or less is blue, you know, 380 to 400 is more of a violet. Okay, these are different wavelengths of light. And white light is made up of all the wavelengths. Okay, all the wavelengths of visible light together constitute white light. Okay, or the light from the sun is all the wavelengths together. Okay, then we have infrared wa uh, infrared waves, which are longer than visible light, microwaves, which are even longer, and finally radio waves, which are the longest. Okay, now what you need to know is that the shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy, right? The shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy. That's important to understand. Now, how does, how does it work? Why are plants green? Let me explain that real quick. Plants appear green, believe it or not, because they do not use green light. They do not absorb green light. Remember the light, the white light that comes from the sun? 
that visible light is white, okay? And when it strikes the granum, when it strikes those thylakoids, you have these pigment molecules called chlorophyll, which I'll talk to you about in a little bit, you know, chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B. You may have heard of these before, but they absorb light, right? But what's funny is they absorb all the colors except for green. Green goes right through the chloroplast out the other side, which means transmitted light. Transmitted light is light that passes through. And green is also reflected off the surface here. That's called reflected light. So the, when, you, when you look outside and look at a tree and look at its green leaves, the reason those green leaves appear green is because the plant is absorbing the, uh, the spectrum, all the different colors of light, except for green. The plant is not using green light. The plant is transmitting and reflecting green light. Plants do not absorb a green light, right? Especially these green plants. So if you, for example, if you were trying to grow plants and you used green lights in order to do it, uh, those plants would not grow what, whatsoever. Isn't that interesting? So that's something to understand about how light works. Now, the reason why plants appear green and why plants absorb those colors besides green are because of these pigment molecules. These pigments are important for the light reactions of photosynthesis. These pigments are vital for capturing sunlight and these pigments exist in the thylakoid membrane of the granum. Now look at this. There are three types of pigments to know about, but the two main ones are called chlorophyll A, which is the key light capturing pigment that participates directly in the light reactions of photosynthesis. Remember phase one of photosynthesis. And then there are the, you know, lesser chlorophyll B, which is an accessory pigment, as well as carotenoids, which are a separate group of accessory pigments. Again, these pigments are vital, vital for absorbing light and allowing the light reactions of photosynthesis to take place, especially chlorophyll A. So let me show you what the chlorophyll A and B molecules look like. What do these pigments look like? Here you can see the structure, the backbone of both chlorophyll A and B. Remember how I taught you that when you see a structure like this, you could fill it in for yourself with carbons and hydrogens? So obviously this is a large organic molecule, right? And look in the middle, there is a cofactor magnesium. This ring here in the center of chlorophyll A and B is known as a forfarin ring with the light absorbing head of the molecule. There's a magnesium atom at the center here, which is a cofactor. And what's neat is that the only difference between chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B is this functional group right here. Here with chlorophyll A, there's a methyl group right here on the molecule, whereas with chlorophyll B, there's a carbonyl group right here on the molecule. That's the only difference between the two. So let's talk about what these pigment molecules actually do. Now, when a pigment molecule such as chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, or one of the carotenoids absorbs light, one of its electrons goes from a ground state with a low G value, low free energy, to an excited state with a high G value, a high free energy, which is unstable. Here's kind of what a depiction of that looks like. If this is chlorophyll right here, this is the pigment molecule, chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, this could even be a carotenoid here, this is a pigment molecule. When when a photon of light, when photon hits the chlorophyll molecule, remember it absorbs all the colors except for green, this causes one of its electrons to go from a ground state with a low free energy, or low G value, to a higher excited state with a high free energy, a high G value. That captures, in effect, what's happening is the you're capturing that sunlight energy by 
making this electron hop from a ground state to an excited state. When that electron goes in, inevitably, that electron's going to go back down to the ground state, that the electron's going to collapse back to a more stable ground state. When it does, this pigment releases that captured energy. So you can think of a chlorophyll molecule kind of like a capacitor in electronics. You charge up a capacitor, and then the capacitor can release that charge. Here, the pigment molecules get charged up with photons of light, and then when those electrons collapse back to where they should be, they release that energy, that trapped energy. All right, so that's essentially how a chlorophyll molecule works. It becomes excited and captures that sunlight energy, and then it can release that energy once the electrons travel back to their ground state. Okay, so now it's time to go into a little more detail about what really happens during the light reactions of photosynthesis, and then we'll talk about what really happens during the Calvin cycle. But first, let's start with the light reactions. Remember the big picture here? We want to use sunlight and the granum, right, the thylakoid membrane plays an integral role in the light reaction. So we're going to be focusing on the pancake stacks. We're going to be focusing on those thylakoids, those granum, okay, because that's where the light reactions occur. That's where those chlorophyll molecules are, right, and that's what's very important for capturing sunlight. And what happens during the light reactions? Remember, we are using light energy in order to, in order to oxidize water to oxygen to produce ATP and produce NADPH. Remember, we are stealing hydrogens from water so that we can reduce NADP plus to NADPH, okay? Again, the hydrogens from water will end up on NADP plus, reducing it to NADPH. And thanks to our sunlight, this, this is made possible. We also make ATP and oxygen. So let's look. Now I want you to pay special attention to this. Look, Remember how thylakoids have a curve to them, like a membrane that has a curve to it? I just want you to look at this right here. Imagine this curve right here of the thylakoid. Now I'm going to take you to this curve. Ready? Just picture this curve, okay? There is that curve. This is the pancake. We're looking at the pancake, okay? This is one thylakoid, one pancake of the stack. This is the thylakoid membrane. What's the fluid out here? What do you think? Can you beat Wicket? What's the fluid outside of the pancake stacks? That's right, Wicket. Hopefully you got it too. This is the stroma. That makes this fluid inside of the pancake the thylakoid space. I hope you're oriented, right? Thylakoid space, thylakoid membrane, stroma, okay? And remember, this is where the magic happens for the light reactions of photosynthesis. What you're seeing before you right now is called linear electron flow, and I'll explain why in a little bit. This is where the pigment molecules play a role. This is where light plays a role. This is where we, you know, create ATP and NADPH as well as oxygen. This is where those light reactions occur. So before I explain it in detail, I want to show you all the players that are involved here, okay? I just want to, you know, don't get bogged down in details at this point. I just want you to see the big players here, okay? Um, part of this is this guy. You guys should all be familiar with this guy down here. Look at this guy. Who's this guy? We've seen him before. This right here is ATP synthase. Remember what ATP synthase does? We learned about it in the last chapter, cellular respiration. The top part of ATP synthase spins and spins so that the bottom part can make ATP, right? Remember that? So this is ATP synthase, a welcome figure, a welcome friend, so, so uh, an enzyme transmembrane protein complex that we know about from before. Here's another thing we know about from before, believe it or not. You see this right here, PQ cytochrome complex, which is transmembrane, 
and PC. PQ stands for plastoquinone. Here you have the cytochrome complex, and then PC stands for plastocyanin. Now, this may not look familiar, but I guarantee you know how this works. These three together are known as an electron transport chain, an electron transport chain. And we learned about electron transport chains in cellular respiration. Remember, what, what do electron transport chains do? Do you remember, what did the four complexes in the mitochondria do? Do you remember that electrons would flow? You see the, you see the orange arrows? Look at this. Do you remember that electrons can flow through an electron transport chain, giving the transport chain the power to do what? Can you beat Wicket? What does the electron transport chain use the electron flow power to do? That's right, Wicket, to pump protons. Do you remember that? Electron transport chains, they use electron flow in order to power a pump. In this case, there's only one pump. The pump is called cytochrome complex. In the case of cellular respiration, do you remember there were three pumps? Pumps one, three, and four, which were proton pumps. Well, here you only have one proton pump, the transmembrane complex called cytochrome complex. And look what it does. Look what it does, you guys. It takes protons, protons from the stroma, the fluid outside of the pancake stacks, and it uses that electron flow energy to pump the protons into the pancakes, okay? It pumps the protons actively into the thylakoid space, and it gets the energy for active transport of protons from electron flow. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so far, so far, we have an ATP synthase. We have an electron transport chain. Those are very similar to components of cellular respiration. The concepts are the same, okay? Now, here's a little enzyme that's friendly over here. Look at this enzyme over here at the top right. This enzyme is called NADP plus reductase, okay? That means it's the, remember ACE means enzyme, so it's the enzyme that reduces NADP plus. So what this little enzyme does is that when it receives electrons, it gives those electrons to NADP plus, which is the electron carrier. You see, this is an electron carrier, kind of like NAD plus or FAD. Remember, NADP plus is the electron carrier and NADP plus reductase reduces NADP plus to NADPH. Okay, so again, we have three components we just discussed, the ATP synthase, an electron transport chain, and an enzyme called NADP plus reductase which hands electrons to the electron carrier NADP+, reducing it to NADPH. Now, there's two more structures here which we need to look at. Look at this thing that looks kind of like an apple, right? You see this thing? It kind of looks like an apple, okay? And that looks like the core of the apple, right? And here's another one. Here's another one of these structures that looks like an apple. It's drawn like an apple. Those are the two new things that you know, need more explanation, okay? Th these things that look like apples are also part of the light reactions of photosynthesis and very, very important for photosynthesis. These are known as the photosystems, okay? This one here is called photosystem two, and this one here is called photosystem one, and both are integral. It's so important for the light reactions of photosynthesis because these, this is where those chlorophyll molecules exist. This is where those pigment molecules exist. You see, in fact, these green dots are all pigments, okay? These green dots are all pigment molecules like chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, right? So very, very important. The reason 
why light is captured is thanks to these photosystems, right? Like photosystem two. Now, what's funny is that photosystem two appears first in this in this chain, right? Photosystem two appears first, and later on down the road, you're dealing with photosystem one. And the only reason for that, this trips up students all the time because students think, how come the first one how come the first photosystem isn't called photosystem one? And it's simply because this one was discovered first, right? So photosystem one was discovered first, and then photosystem two was discovered later, uh, even though it's more upstream. It's, it's at the beginning of this process, okay? So we don't know how these photosystems work yet, do we? We don't know what these apple-looking things do, do we? Okay, so I'm going to explain that next. But I just want you to know ahead of time that they're so important for capturing light and letting the process of the light reactions occur. But now, look at this apple, okay? Look at this one, photosystem, right? Look at these photosystems. Let's go into detail about how these photosystems work. So in, so in the next little segment, I'm going to explain exactly how these little photosystems work. All right, let's delve into those apple-looking things that are called photosystems. So remember this? This is what I was talking about, the photosystem. Now, photosystems have two major parts. Let's just break this down real quick. There's the purple part that surrounds the blue part. You see this? The purple part is really where the story begins. This purple part of the protein complex is called the light harvesting complex, right? Actually, there are several complexes. There, these are the light harvesting complexes, and they surround the blue part. The blue part in the center is called the reaction center complex, okay? Those are the two main parts to a apple, right, to a photosystem. The light harvesting complexes which surround a reaction center complex, okay? So let's break it down. Now, let's break it down. Let's start in the purple part. Let's start in one of these light harvesting complexes because that's really where the story begins, okay? Now, focus in on this. Look what, look what we have in the light harvesting complex. Look at this. These green things are pigment molecules such as chlorophyll, right? Like chlorophyll A, for instance. <clears throat> so here you have several pigments inside of the light harvesting complex. You have many of them, okay? And here's how it works. Ready? Light travels from the sun and strikes a pigment molecule. Remember, like chlorophyll A. And if you recall from a previous slide, this has an effect on chlorophyll A, right? Chlorophyll A, its electrons get excited and move to a higher energy state. And then when those electrons collapse back to their ground state, this pigment molecule actually releases that captured energy. And look what it does. It releases that captured energy and passes it to its neighbor. Okay, I want you to see what, what's going on here. Again, light struck this pigment, this, let's say, chlorophyll A. This pigment, its electron went to a higher energy state, capturing that sunlight energy. And when that electron goes back to ground, this pigment releases that captured energy to its neighbor. It's not, okay, let me, let me just clarify. It's not passing the light to its neighbor. It's not passing electrons to its neighbor. It's passing the trapped energy, the captured energy from that photon to its neighbor. So it's only passing energy to its neighbor, okay? Um, now, what's really cool is that there's this domino action that happens now, like a cascade. Look at this. The light excites this pigment. This pigment then releases that trapped energy to excite its neighbor. Now its neighbor is excited. Look, this chlorophyll molecule got excited, but not directly from light, right? This second chlorophyll pigment did not get excited by light. 
it got excited from its neighbor who was excited by light. So all you needed was light to start this reaction. Look, light only had to excite this pigment, which then sent the energy to the next pigment. And guess what he does? That's right. He sends the energy to the next pigment and then the next pigment and then the next pigment. It's almost like doing the wave at a sporting event, right? When someone starts the wave, well, that's it. You got to go with it and everyone's going to do the wave, right? So only one person has to get excited enough to start the wave and then the wave carries on around the stadium, right? So it's kind of like the analogy I like to share with my students. But again, the light only had to excite the first pigment, which then excites its neighbor, who excites his neighbor, who excites its neighbor, who excites its neighbor. But look what happens. Eventually, the energy, the excitement, the energy reaches the blue part. Okay, the blue part of the complex. Let's talk about this. Okay, let's move on to what's called the reaction center complex, the blue part of the uh, photo system. Here, the blue part always has two special chlorophyll A's, and they're literally called the special pair of chlorophyll A molecules. In fact, they have spe even more special names. The special pair on photosystem 2 is called P680, and the special pair on photosystem 1 is called P700. So when I say P680, I'm talking about the special pair on photosystem 2. When I say P700, I'm talking about the special pair on photosystem 1. And they really are just a pair of chlorophylls. But these are special because they exist in the blue part, the reaction center. And they do something special. Let me explain what they do. When the excitement, the energy, when the energy reaches the special pair, the special pair of chlorophyll A, molecules, either P680 or P700, this actually, it, these behave kind of like a electronegativity switch, okay? Depending on your class, you may or may not need to know this level of detail, but what happens is when excitement reaches this pair, this pair goes from very electronegative to not very electronegative, and when they switch to not very electronegative, they give away their electrons. So electrons move, not energy this time, not energy, the black lines are energy, right? But this time, when the energy reaches the special pair, the special pair becomes, uh, it switches to not very electronegative, and so it gives away its electrons. You see the yellow arrow, okay? It gives away the electrons to its neighbor, this box, okay? This box represents the primary electron acceptor. So the special pair, once excited, give away electrons. So they pass not energy to a neighbor. They're special because they pass electrons to the neighbor. And once the electrons reach this box, those electrons are free to leave the whole photosystem. Those electrons are free to go on a journey and abandon the photosystem and go on a journey. Okay, again, one more time, the light harvesting complex, the purple part is where the story begins. A photon of light strikes a pigment molecule in the light harvesting complex, exciting it, which then releases that excitement to excite its neighbor with energy, who can then become excited and excite his neighbor with energy, and then its neighbor with energy, and then its neighbor with energy. When the energy reaches the special chlorophyll pair, the special chlorophyll pair switches to uh, a state which is not very electronegative and is more than willing to give up its electrons. Those electrons hop to this box, which is the primary electron acceptor, and then those electrons go on a journey. Okay, so knowing that, knowing that, now you know how a photosystem works, and now you have all the key concepts to understand the light reactions of photosynthesis. So let's hop back to the light reactions of photosynthesis so we can truly, once and for all, figure out what is happening during those steps. All right, we're back. Remember, this curved membrane is the membrane of a pancake, a thylakoid, right? So this is the thylakoid membrane. Remember, this is the stroma out here. This is the thylakoid space down inside of here. And so really what we're looking at is mainly what's going on in the 
pancake, right? What's going on in the thylakoid? Now, again, remember, the story begins right here. So let's start our story here with Photosystem 2. Photosystem 2, as all photosystems, light travels from the sun. Remember, let's zoom in here. Light travels from the sun and strikes this pigment molecule. This pigment, remember, becomes excited, and then it can pass that energy on to its neighbor, which then becomes excited and passes its energy on to its neighbor, which passes its energy on to its neighbor, which passes the energy to its neighbor, which passes the energy to who? What is this? That's right, Wicket. This is P680, the special pair of chlorophyll A on photosystem 2. Now, what was special about the special pair? When energy reaches the special pair, what can the special pair pass on? That's right, see this arrow right here, this orange arrow? This is electrons being passed from the special pair to the box, right? To the primary electron acceptor, the box. Now, now, um, what, do, what happens when the box, when the special pair receives the electrons? What can those electrons do? Do you remember what I said before? <laughs> of course, you're right, Wicket. The electrons can leave uh, the photosystem altogether and go on a journey. Remember, the electrons can now go and leave the whole photosystem, and that's what this orange arrow is showing. Those electrons can now leave the photosystem. So let's follow their journey. Here we go. The electrons are leaving the photosystem. They're traveling through plastoquinone. Remember, and this is an electron transport chain, so this is a spontaneous flow of electrons, by the way. The electrons are stolen by plastoquinone, then they're stolen by cytochrome complex, then they go through plastocyanin, and then they get stuck. Let's say they get stuck right here on P700, the special pair of chlorophyll A on photosystem one. But let's go back to this. Let's go back to this part here. Let's not skip through this too fast. The, again, the electrons went spontaneously through this electron transport chain. And that's a spontaneous process, right, which releases energy. Energy that you can use to do work via energy coupling. Remember, what's the job of an of a electron transport chain? Remember, electron transport chains have uh, proton pumps. Remember proton pumps? So cytochrome complex here is a proton pump. It actively pumps protons, in this case from the stroma out here. See the red arrow? Protons are being pumped from the stroma out here into the thylakoid space in here. Isn't that neat? And that's an active transport of protons. And the more electrons flow, the more protons are actively pumped. So would you agree then, if this is the case, you would end up with a high concentration of protons in the thylakoid space? Again, why? Because cytochrome complex is actively pumping protons into the thylakoid space. So we should be getting a high concentration of protons in the thylakoid space. Are you with me? But let me show you something else. If protons are high in concentration in the thylakoid space, but relatively low in concentration in the stroma, doesn't that mean the protons would like to, I don't know, diffuse out of the uh, out of the thylakoid? Think about it. Wouldn't the protons want to diffuse out into the stroma? But let me ask you this. From what we've learned so far, can protons, which are positively charged, can protons diffuse through a membrane directly? That's right, Wicket. No, they cannot, right? They cannot because they are charged. Charged things can't just cross a membrane. But what is this character over here? Remember this guy over at the bottom right? What is this guy? We learned about him in the previous chapter. This is ATP synthase. ATP synthase says, sure, come on, protons. Go ahead and squeeze on by. But remember, at a cost, right? Remember what happens? ATP synthase 
is a carrier for protons. It allows protons to squeeze by. It, it, it allows protons to attach to the rotating head. Then that provides uh, a proton motive force, remember, to spin ATP synthase as the protons squeeze their way out, okay? Um, so essentially what's happening is just like in cellular respiration, the protons are doing chemiosmosis, which means diffusion of protons across the membrane, exerting a force called the proton motive force. And that is what's providing the energy to spin the top of ATP synthase, right? That's what's, the, so the protons leaving, uh, diffusing out is what's spinning the top of ATP synthase. And that means the bottom part is doing what? That's right, the bottom part has the power now it needs to join ADP along with inorganic phosphate to form ATP. Isn't that neat? So the energy for production of ATP during the light reactions of photosynthesis is provided by chemiosmosis of protons through ATP synthase. And by the way, uh, on the exam, if they ask, how was this ATP synthesized? How was this ATP made? The technical term for this is actually photophosphorylation. Isn't that neat? Because photons of light were required for this ATP to be made. So this is known as photophosphorylation resulting in ATP production. And remember, that ATP is made and now it's going to make its way through the stroma, right, where it was made. The ATP was made in the stroma. That ATP is on its way to the next phase. Remember, the next phase of the photosynthesis is called Calvin cycle. So that's where the ATP is headed, okay? So isn't that neat? Again, those electrons went through the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain actively pumped protons. Those protons chemiosmose back out, spinning ATP synthase, allowing ATP synthase to make ATP via photophosphorylation. The ATP went to the Calvin cycle. But where did we leave off? Where did we leave off? Weren't the electrons stuck here at the central chlorophyll pair on photosystem one? See, the electrons, I said, they got stuck right here at P700, the special chlorophyll pair of chlorophyll A on photosystem one. And they're going to be stuck there until what? Until, look at this, until light traveling from the sun strikes a pigment molecule in the light harvesting complex of photosystem one, exciting this pigment molecule, which then releases the excitement to excite its neighbor, who excites its neighbor, who releases its energy to excite its neighbor. And again, the excitement reaches who? It reaches the special chlorophyll pair fo uh, of photosystem one called P700. And what does the special pair do once it's uh, energized, once it receives that energy? That's right, it switches to a very non-electronegative state. It's called a negative EO state, which can then which can then release those electrons. Remember, the special pair doesn't release energy. It actually releases those trapped electrons, passing the electrons to the box, right? The primary electron acceptor. And where what happens to those electrons once they get passed to the primary electron acceptor, that's right, those electrons are free to leave the photosystem altogether, and that's what you see here. The electrons leave the photosystem. They go through this carrier to our friend here. Remember, I told you about this enzyme, this special enzyme that's attached to the outside of the thylakoid membrane. This enzyme is called the enzyme that reduces NADP plus or NADP plus reductase. So I ask my students, I ask my students, is this enzyme NADP plus? No, that's right, Wicket. This enzyme is not NADP plus. This is the enzyme that reduces NADP plus. What does reduce mean? That's right, Wicket. It means give electrons to. So when those electrons, look, when those electrons reach NADP plus reductase, NADP plus reductase's job is to hand those electrons to NADP plus, the electron carrier. The electron carrier, in addition to picking up uh, the electrons, also picks up, picks up a proton from the stroma, 
and it becomes reduced. NADP plus picks up those electrons and a proton to become reduced to NADPH. Here's your H, okay? And remember that NADPH now goes to the Calvin cycle. Isn't that neat? All right, now not so fast. We're not quite done. There's one more part of this uh, process to talk about. Remember, the, these are known as the light reactions, the uh, light reactions of photosynthesis, which is the first part of photosynthesis. Okay, there's one more part to talk about here, and it's at the very beginning. Okay, let's focus in on the very beginning. Remember what happened. Remember, energy from the sun struck a, a pigment molecule, which then excited its neighbor, who excited its neighbor, who excited its neighbor, who excited its neighbor. And remember, when the excitement reached P680, the special chlorophyll pair, the special chlorophyll pair released those electrons to the primary electron acceptor on the reaction center, and then those electrons went on that wild ride, right? But doesn't that mean that P680 is now oxidized? Doesn't that mean that P680 is missing uh, those electrons now? So what that should tell you is, if we need, don't we need to reload P680 with electrons so it can do this again? Because think about it, P680 just let go of its electrons, and those electrons went on this wild ride, right? So we need to reload P680 with electrons. In fact, at this point, P680, because it's missing those electrons, is called P680+, plus, okay? P680+. Plus. And what's really neat about P680+, plus is that now P680+, plus, along with an enzyme, is one of the most oxidative forces in the world. Uh, they, they call P680 a electronegativity switch. Remember, because when P680 has electrons and it becomes excited, it becomes not very electronegative. In fact, it's so not electronegative, it gives away its electrons. But once it gives away its electrons, it's almost like it has like remorse. You know, it's it now that it gives away its electrons and it's P680 plus, it switches to super greedy, you know, off the charts, super greedy for electrons, right? So greedy that it's one of the most oxidative forces on the planet. And it can actually steal electrons from who? Remember this guy right here? Who's this guy? Water. Remember water was required for the light reactions of photosynthesis. In fact, water is the source of the electrons, those hydrogens, right? So P680 plus, with the help of an enzyme, steals electrons, literally steals electrons from the master thief oxygen, giving those electrons to P680 plus, reducing P680 plus back to P680 so that we've reloaded this photosystem so that it can send more electrons down the road, okay? And when you've oxidized water, when you've taken water's electrons away in order to reload P680 plus with electrons, what's left of your water? That's right, uh, one half O2 or you know, oxygen. Oxygen is a byproduct, okay? Isn't that neat? So the reason why plants need water, the reason why photosynthesis requires water is because water is the source of the electrons, the electrons needed to reload P680 plus with electrons so that those electrons can go on this wild ride. Those electrons can be used in uh, photosynthesis and oxygen is a byproduct of oxidizing water. Isn't that neat? So so let's just, let's just sum this up real quick. Let's sum this up. What if I were to ask you, let's see if you can beat Wicket. What are the reactants for just the light reactions of photosynthesis? That's right, reactants, that's right, Wicket. Reactants mean, what do you need? You need light and you need water, right? Now, what if I were to ask you, what are the three products of the light reactions of photosynthesis? What would you say? That's right, hopefully you beat Wicket. Oxygen is the byproduct. We also have NADPH 
and we have ATP via photophosphorylation, okay? And it's the ATP and the NADPH which are on their way to phase two of the photosynthesis process known as Calvin cycle in the stroma. Oxygen is not needed by the you know system anymore, by photosynthesis anymore. And again, I just want to show you the big picture, right? The big picture here is that we took electrons from water, right? So watch this. This is the story of the journey of electrons. The electrons began on water. Those electrons were transferred to P680+. Plus. Those electrons made their way from photosystem 2 through the electron transport chain all the way to photosystem 1 and then released from photosystem 1 all the way to our enzyme friend NADP plus reductase who handed those electrons to the electron carrier NADP plus reducing it to NADPH and here are those electrons these electrons were from water, right? And those electrons in the form of hydrogen here, those electrons are going on their way to the Calvin cycle in order to help form sugar for us. All right, let's go back to our nice overview figure here and just kind of look at the big picture again. Remember, the whole point of photosynthesis is to make sugar for sugars, we need C's, H's, and O's. And during the light reactions, we actually captured some H's, right? Do you remember what we did? We took H's, we took electrons from water with the help of sunlight. We took those H's and who did we hand it to? We gave the electrons to NADP+, which then reduced NADP plus to NADPH. So here's our H's. Our H's went from water to, to NADPH, which are on their way to the Calvin cycle. Do you remember we also formed some ATP via photophosphorylation? And do you remember when we oxidized H2O? We, we were left with the byproduct of oxygen. And this is what plants breathe out, right? Now, we're done with the story of the thylakoids, right? The granum. The rest of the story picks up where? At the Calvin cycle, which takes place in the stroma. Remember, this is the fluid outside of these pancake stacks, these granum, okay? Here in the Calvin cycle, I'm going to show you how sugar is made by taking CO2 out of the air and by reducing it to sugar. So let's talk about the Calvin cycle and how the Calvin cycle makes sugar for the plant. All right, the Calvin cycle, which takes place in the stroma, is almost like a reverse Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle. Let me ask you this before we, before we delve into the Calvin cycle. Do you recall what happened during the citric acid cycle of cellular respiration in a mitochondrion? Do you remember we took a sugar and we oxidized it until there was nothing left un except CO2, right? So the citric acid cycle took a sugar and oxidized it, stole its H's, took its H's away until there was nothing left but CO2. Well, the Calvin cycle is like an inverse citric acid cycle. It's like the opposite. What's the opposite of taking a sugar and stealing all of its electrons until there's nothing left but CO2? Well, the opposite of that would be taking CO2 and handing it H's, handing it hydrogens until it became sugar. Isn't that neat? So we're reducing CO2 to sugar. Um, that's what's ultimately happening during the Calvin cycle. Let me show you exactly how it works, and hopefully that makes better sense in a little bit. There are three phases to the Calvin cycle. Phase one is called carbon fixation, which relies on this enzyme called Rubisco. I'm going to show you how that works in a minute, but phase one is called carbon fixation. Phase two is called reduction.
and phase three is the regeneration of the CO2 acceptor RUBP or ribulose bisphosphate. This sounds very complicated, but it's really not. I'm gonna show you how it works just in the next step. And again, recall that the Calvin cycle occurs in the stroma of the chloroplast. So here's how it works, okay? Um, I know, again, I know it looks complicated and convoluted, but it's really not that bad. I'm gonna explain it in detail so that you fully get it. Um, so this is a cycle, and remember biochemical cycles are metabolic processes where the end product, remember what a cycle is? The end product is required for the beginning of the cycle, okay? That's what makes a cycle. Remember in um, cellular respiration during the citric acid cycle, we had to regenerate oxaloacetate because we needed it to start a new cycle. Well, here at the end of the cycle, you have to regenerate this guy, this organic molecule right here. Look at this. You, every time you do a Calvin cycle, at the end of the Calvin cycle, you have to regenerate this molecule. This molecule is very important. This molecule is called RUBP, also known as ribulose bisphosphate. Okay, and what's so special about RUBP, ribulose bisphosphate? What's so special about it that we have to regenerate it at the end of every Calvin cycle? Well, let me tell you. Ribulose bisphosphate is a uh, five carbon sugar. See, one, two, three, four, five. It's a five carbon sugar that needs to be replenished at the end of every Calvin cycle. It is also known as the carbon acceptor. It's called the CO2 acceptor, the CO2 acceptor. So when someone's talking about the Calvin cycle and the CO2 acceptor, this is what they're referring to. They're referring to RUBP. Now, okay, what's so special about RUBP? Well, watch this. Okay, here's how it works. You ready? RUBP is this five carbon molecule and here's what's happening. What's entering, what's entering the Calvin cycle? You see here at the top, what enters the Calvin cycle? CO2, right? Remember, the Calvin cycle is able to take CO2 out of thin air, out of the atmosphere, out, out of just air, and it's able to capture that CO2. And do you know how it does it? An enzyme called Rubisco, and I know this is kind of confusing because usually enzymes end in ACE, and Rubisco is just one of those rare enzymes that doesn't end in ACE. But this very, very important and um, abundant enzyme called Rubisco, what it does is it literally takes CO2 out of thin air and adds it onto RUBP. It takes CO2 from the air and connects it to the solid molecule RUBP. So, so in essence, carbon dioxide goes from a gas state, and once you attach it to RUBP, it's in a solid state, okay? And this is known as carbon fixation. Phase one is called carbon fixation. During carbon fixation, just to summarize, the enzyme Rubisco takes CO2 and connects it to the, to the CO2 acceptor molecule, RUBP, also known as ribulose bisphosphate. And this causes ribulose bisphosphate to kind of enter this transition state and then get cleaved in half into glycerol, uh, sorry, 3-phosphoglycerate. You don't need to know all these baby steps. You, don't, you just need to know, for my class anyway, you need to know the main concept. What was the main concept? During phase one, Rubisco uh, fixed the carbon, took CO2 out of the air, added it to RUBP. Okay, now haven't we captured C's and O's from the atmosphere? We have captured CO2. We have captured C's and O's. Have we made sugar yet? No, that's right, Wicket. We have not made sugar yet. 
we've captured C's and O's. In order to make sugar, we need C's, H's, and O's, right? Do we have a source of H's? That's right, Wicket. We have a source of H's in the form of, remember, N-A-D-P-H. Those H's are what we need. Those H's were from water, remember? Those H's, those electrons were from water originally. Now we have the H's because this nice little electron carrier carried those H's from the light reactions to the Calvin cycle. So what we want to do at this point is hand those H's to our captured C's and O's, right? So that way we have C's, H's, and O's. So if we want to give H's, okay, we want to hand, look, we want to hand these H's to our CO2, right? To our captured C's and O's. Um, that's called reduction, right? Because Re we're giving electrons to the C's and O's. Remember, GER, gain of electrons means reduced. So what do you think phase two is called? Phase two is called reduction. Why? Because we are reducing the carbon dioxide. We are giving hydrogens, which contain electrons. We are giving them to the C's and the O's that we captured, that we fixed. That's known as reduction. And when we do that, what have we formed? We formed C's, H's, and O's, which is sugar. First, we make a three-carbon sugar usually, and then two of these stick together to make a glucose, a six-carbon sugar. Isn't that cool? As well as other organic compounds as well. Isn't that fantastic? So again, during phase one, we've captured our C's and our O's. During phase two, we've then given those C's and the O's H's. We've reduced the C's and O's. In, in effect, we have reduced CO2 to sugar, okay? And that's called reduction. And by the way, do you think it's easy to make sugar? And by easy, I mean spontaneous. I mean negative delta G. Do you think it's a negative delta G process to hand hydrogens to carbon dioxide to make sugar? No, that's right, Wicket. It is not. Breaking down sugar is spontaneous, and that releases a lot of energy, but not making sugar. Making sugar is non-spontaneous. Making sugar is positive delta G. So we need a source of energy. Do we have a source of energy? <laughs> right again, Wicket. We have ATP, right? Remember, this ATP, Mosey DeLong got here from the light reactions of photosynthesis, right? Remember this ATP was made by photophosphorylation during the light reactions of photosynthesis. So we're using ATP energy in order to reduce our C's and our O's to sugar. Isn't that neat? Now, we're not done because remember what's the, what happens at the end of every cycle? You have to replenish something at the end of every cycle to start a new cycle. So the phase three is regenerating what? Phase three involves regenerating RUBP. We need to make another ribulose bisphosphate, another CO2 acceptor, so that it can go along and accept another CO2 from Rubisco. Isn't that neat? So again, the point of Calvin cycle is to make sugar. It gets its C's and its O's from CO2, and then it gets its H's from NADPH, which is from water originally. Isn't that neat? So sugars are CH2O, right? Some multiple of CH2O. Glucose is C6H12O6. Those C's and those O's came from CO2, and those H's came from water originally, from water to NADPH, from NADPH to the sugar, okay? And that's how the overall process works. Isn't that neat? Now you fully understand photosynthesis. All right, before I let you go, there are a couple more concepts that you may want to know about, about photosynthesis. And that it has to do with, first of all, the light reactions. Do you remember the light reactions? I told you about how light and water are used to form NADPH, ATP, and oxygen. Well, this is known as not just the light reactions, but linear electron flow during the light reactions. What's linear electron flow mean? 
Well, it just, everything I explained is linear electron flow. You see how the electrons began on water and then the electrons were passed to P680 plus and then the electrons were passed from photosystem two through the electron transport chain to photosystem one and then the electrons were passed to the enzyme NADP plus reductase and then the electrons were passed to NADP plus, reducing it to NADPH, which then left. Well, that's linear electron flow. Why? Because the electrons are flowing in a linear fashion, right? So if I ask you on the exam, what are the three products of a linear electron flow of the light reactions? You would say what? You would say NADPH, ATP, and oxygen. Okay, great. But did you know there was a thing called cyclic electron flow? That's right, cyclic electron flow. In cyclic electron flow, photoexcited electrons cycle back from FD to the cytochrome complex instead of being transferred to NADP+. That sounds like a mouthful, so let's explore what that means. Here you can kind of see what they're talking about. When the electrons reach photosystem 1 at P700, and remember normally during linear electron flow, the electrons go to the enzyme uh, NADP plus reductase. However, during cyclic electron flow, those electrons are able to cycle back through the electron transport chain and then do it over and over and over again. So it's, this is known as cyclic electron flow because the electrons flow around and around in a cycle. They don't actually get to the end. They, they go around and around and around. So let me show you how that looks on our previous example. All right, do you recall linear electron flow? The electrons started on water. The electrons went on this journey. Do, do, do. See the electrons? I told you at some point the electrons reached P700, right? You see here? The electrons reached P700. And normally, when light strikes and excites all these neighbors, remember what happens during linear electron flow? The electrons go towards the right, right? The electrons go to this enzyme, NADP+. However, plants can switch from linear electron flow to cyclic electron flow. In this case, what happens is instead of those electrons going up from P700 off to the right, the electrons will transfer back, they'll cycle back through FD, they'll cycle back through the electron transport chain. So they'll do this, look, they'll go from P700, then when they leave P700, they'll cycle back. You see, that's why it's called cyclic, because it just cycles back, and then it'll cycle back. Every time light, every time light excites these pigments, the electrons leave P700 and they cycle back through the electron transport chain. Then they cycle back through the electron transport chain. Then they cycle back through the electron transport chain. And the plants, they can switch from linear electron flow to cyclic electron flow um, to make more ATP. Okay, so think about it. What's the only product? If, if I'm only doing this over and over again, I've kind of short-circuited this process, right? And the electrons just keep going around and around. And as long as there's light, as long as there's light, the electrons just keep going around and around and around. W let me ask you this. Maybe you can beat Wicket. What's the only product of cyclic electron flow? What's the only product if I'm doing this over and over again? Think about it. That's right, Wicket, just ATP. Because think about it. Every time the electrons flow through the electron transport chain, what does the electron transport chain do? That's right, it pumps protons actively. And that builds protons in the, in, in the thylakoid space, which then chemiosmos and exert a proton motive force, spinning ATP synthase, allowing us to make ATP via photophosphorylation. So what you need to know is that during cyclic electron flow, the only product is ATP. And we finally reached the final concept that I need you to know, okay? This is the final concept, I promise, of chapter 10, and that is the 
the the juxtaposition of the mitochondrion and the chloroplasts. I want you to know about these important things they have in common. On the left, you see a drawing of a mitochondrion, and on the right, there is a drawing of a chloroplast. And what I want you to know is that there are so many similarities between these two organelles. First of all, both of them have a very important membrane in which uh, there is an electron transport chain as well as an ATP synthase. So think about it. In the mitochondrion, which membrane possessed both the electron transport chain and an ATP synthase? It was the inner membrane, right? Remember the highly convoluted cristae of the inner membrane? That's where you found an electron transport chain as well as an ATP synthase. But in a chloroplast, where did you find the electron transport chain and an ATP synthase? That's right, it was the thylakoid membrane, right? The membrane of the pancake stacks. Okay, now another thing you need to know. Both the mitochondrion and the chloroplast have areas of high proton concentration. Where is the proton concentration high in a mitochondrion? That's right, Wicket. It was the intermembrane space, the dark gray area, is where the proton concentration was high. And what about in the chloroplast? Where was the proton concentration high? That's right, the dark gray area. The, in this case, the thylakoid space, the space inside of the granum. Great. Now, also in both, there was an area where ATP was synthesized. Where was the actual ATP synthesized in the mitochondrion? The light gray area, the matrix. And where was the actual ATP synthesized in the chloroplast? The light gray area, the stroma. Okay, so what I want you to be able to do is just like I did, juxtapose, compare and contrast the mitochondrion and the chloroplast based on what? based on where are the electron transport chain and ATP synthase, where is the proton concentration high, and where is ATP synthesized. And with that, we reached the end of chapter 10. Thank you so much for joining me. Hopefully it was understandable. I tried to break things down as straightforward as I can. Please leave any questions you have in the comment box below, and I'll see you guys next time. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, a Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, a Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, a Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D, Doctor D.